welcome everyone to the event show live. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for investing your your time uh, to join us this morning. Um, the, the purpose of this show is really to give a voice to the event industry, to to hear from some some leaders in our industry, uh, but also to, to bring each other together and and um, hear from each other. Uh, we've been running an event show podcast for off and on for a couple of years now. Um, one of our panelists, Tom Mottram, has uh, featured on that previously, and we've we've um, enjoyed bringing together um, you know, people from our industry to share their opportunities and, and challenges and stories. And obviously, right now, there's there's a there's a whole different scenario going on for uh, each of us. So um, we thought it's a good time to to come together in this forum. Um, so thanks again for, for joining us. Um, I'll come to our, our, our panelists uh, shortly. Um, what I would like, if, if people can um, drop in to the Q&A box as we go, um, we want to make sure that this, this show is obviously relevant to, to you and the questions um, that you have. Um, so please drop those in and we'll, we'll try and get to as many of those as we can. Um, also, thought it might be nice to drop into the chat box. Just I guess where your where your head's at at the moment. Um, maybe a scale of one to ten. One being not so good, ten being pretty good. Um, maybe feel free to put a few words in in terms of um, yeah where where you're at with the whole situation at the moment. Um, it's a good good way for us to understand, I suppose, how um, everyone's feeling and and for our panelists to get a sort of a, a sense for the room, if you like. So feel free to to drop questions in the Q&A box and thoughts in the chat box as we go. So um, I'll just introduce our, our, our panel for today. So um, we have Tom Mottram from the Australian Grand Prix Corporation. Morning, Tom. Morning, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Uh, great to have you, mate. Um, Jeremy Can from, from Iron Man. Morning, mate. G'day, Andrew. Uh, good to be with you and uh, good to be with uh, Tom and Lucinda. Thank you, JK. Um, we've all been admiring your backdrop. Kona, Hawaii. <laughs> very nice, very nice. And Lucinda Jenkins, who's with the Office for Sport of the New South Wales Government. Fantastic to have you join us as well, Lucinda. Thanks very much for having me, Andrew, and good morning, Jeremy and Tom. Excellent. Great to have you all on. Um, thanks again for everyone for joining us. Um, I guess in terms of um, introduction from myself, my background is, is in major events or events of all shapes and sizes and had the pleasure of working with a, a number of, of you over the years. Um, and I was just, um, I suppose, reflecting with Tom just before this call, actually, uh, how, how quickly our world has changed. And um, I, I know a, a few of the people that are attending today worked on the T20 Women's World Cup and, and what a spectacular occasion that was. And it seems like quite a long time ago in some respects, but um, but but not that long, long ago. And then... Um, I also worked with a few of you a week later at the Sydney Cricket Ground. It was the, the last match of the, it turned out to be the last match of the international cricket season. It was the first match we um, had to close the gates to the public. And um, we were just talking earlier about sort of what a surreal uh, experience that was. And um, I suppose a reflection of how much our, our world has changed and how quickly. Um, but of course, there's, there's lots of things we're working through and um, I think it's certainly time to start to look ahead to what we can be doing now and, and, and what might be coming up next as well. So um, that's very much the, the focus of this show to talk about what we're, what we're going through at the moment, but also a look ahead to the, to the future as well. So, um, so I'm going to jump into, into our panel. Um, Tom, I'm, I'm going to go to you first. Um, really keen for you just to give us a quick rundown of what it is that, that you do in your role and um, yeah, I guess obviously how this, this situation ha has affected you and your team so far. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, so I am the Division Manager of Operations and Risk at the Australian Grand Prix Corporation. So um, essentially my role covers everything from customer experience, uh, corporate services, venue design and management, uh, event presentation, community engagement, security, emergency management and emergency services, traffic and transport, uh, sustainability, and I guess everything in between. Um, and uh, yeah, so for the Grand Prix, so obviously 
um, what what is it now? Just probably over a month ago now, we were, were due to hold our event, and we and we did get um, I guess one quarter of the way there. Uh, we we did roll out the Thursday, and um, as as we all uh, likely know, we um, we were probably um, I guess unfortunately in our timing, as you just touched on before, um, the Women's T20 World Cup was only a week before us. It held. I think just shy of a hundred thousand people and we're only a week later and, and, you know, I think everyone knows, knows what happened there. So um, it just goes to show how quickly um, everything did change and still is changing. And um, yeah, unfortunately for us, we were right at that, um, I guess the start of that, that bell curve. So um, certainly an interesting learning uh, experience for me and, and the entire organization and the entire industry. Um, I think our event was probably the, the catalyst um, and uh, the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak, as well in the um, events industry within Melbourne and Australia. So, um, yeah, certainly, certainly interesting times for us as a, as a business and in the industry, in the events world. But um, we're certainly um, taking this as an as also as an opportunity instead of um, you know looking back. Um, you know, still plenty to work through now, but um, you know, some really exciting times ahead as well. Yeah, no, and, and certainly appreciate the. The, the situation you and your team uh, found yourselves in, in Tom, and um, the way that you did dealt with that and, and reacted to that. Um, I think on, on last week's show, Steve Peterson talked about, I guess, unfortunately, in some respects, the Grand Prix was, was kind of that turning point, I think, for us all, wasn't it, that, that weekend? Um, I think that uh, was recognition for us as an industry, what we were going through, and then I think the wider world recognising that um, how, how big the situation was that, the, um, the infamous Friday the 13th and then the weekend that followed and the weeks that followed. So um, can you tell us a little bit about what your team's been working on the last few weeks and what you're sort of focused on r right now? Yeah, for sure. Um, we uh, are continuing, you know, as, as most of our major events do anyway, there's still a huge debrief process that we need to go through. We, we still got to that finish line. Um, so there's a bunch of work that went into that month and month in the lead up to, to that. And um, as, one of my panelists, Jeremy, will know a past Australian Grand Prix Corporation colleague. Um, so we're still working through just the wrap up of the event, um, which is you know hugely important in our future planning. Um, but then also um, taking this opportunity to um, you know and working remotely from home and everything. So I think um, everyone's getting used to that. There's some that, that pick it up a bit bit quicker than others, and um, we're all working through that and, and learning on our feet. But um, Certainly also, as I, as I mentioned off the top, taking this as an opportunity to um, probably take stock a little bit, um, use it as an opportunity to, to really um, look at what 2021 looks like for us. Um, and also while we've got the time, um, kind of do a lot of those, I guess, systems and, and processes and, and bits and pieces that you never find yourself really being able to do or, or those um, areas of work that um, always seem to get away from you because you're so busy with, with everything else. So um, again, a, a great opportunity for us to be able to kind of um, look forward. Um, you know, me and my team have just been catching up this week on on what our kind of next 30, 60, 90, 120 days look like from a, from a capacity and resourcing and, um, you know, a structure point of view. And, and that's all, all really positive stuff at the moment. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the long and short of, of what we're doing at the moment. Yeah, great. Thanks, Tom. We'll, we'll come back to you as we um, go through the, the, the show. I'll, I'll go to um, Jeremy. Uh, your role at Ironman, it'd be good to hear a bit more about that, Jeremy, for those that, that don't know you and, and obviously what's, what's occurred for you and your team over the last, last month or so. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. Look, I, I head up all of our uh, partnerships, um, both commercial and government partnerships across our Oceania region. Um, and you know, it's probably just worth pointing out that you know Ironman in this market, well, you know, awesome brand, but it's only one component of, of what we do. You know, we run you know thirty odd events um, across Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, Ironman, a, a big part of it, obviously. But you know, I think what a lot of people don't know is that you know. We run and an own, uh, you know, City to Surf and Sydney Half Marathon through the, um, the Fairfax acquisition, which happened about 12 months ago now. You know, we run, uh, you know, Queenstown Marathon, Hawke's Bay Marathon, Auckland Marathon. We've got multi-sport events, the Noosa Tri, uh, the Ultra Trail Australia, one of the, you know, the biggest, uh, you know, world's biggest ultra trail uh, running event and a number of mountain biking events. So we're a, a multifaceted business, um, not just Ironman, which 
Um, a, a lot of people don't quite understand. They know the brand Ironman, but uh, you know, we're, we're a, a very broad, uh, you know, I think we're probably the, the biggest mass participation business in the region. Um, so uh, we've got offices, you know, Australia, uh, in Australia, we've got um, Sunshine Coast, uh, New South Wales, uh, Melbourne and, and in Auckland. So we've got, uh, you know, teams spread across the, the, uh, this region, across all of our areas. So, you know, ops, marketing, uh, commercial, um, business and, and finance uh, across the, 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 uh, the region. Um, and look, yeah, we started the, the year off pretty well. You know, we had uh, six events in the first quarter and um, things were, were looking okay. And the, the sort of the COVID-19, you'd sort of heard some rumblings, but nothing really, uh, nothing major from, a, from an events perspective. Mm. You know, I think we look back, we ran the, uh, the um, Ironman uh, New Zealand about six, eight weeks ago now. And there was really uh, no rumblings of, of any sort of cancellation or postponement. And then we... Then had uh, on the one weekend we had the Mulla Bar Triathlon and Motor Tapu event in uh, in New Zealand, and that Friday there was some uh, it sort of started to escalate pretty dramatically, and that was the day that um, the Prime Minister announced that there'll be no more mass gatherings of greater than 500 people to be effective on the Monday. So we were sort of touch and go on that weekend of whether the events were going to run, you know, so much so that there was a you know a, a, a leadership team meeting on that Friday to determine. A, all the precautions we needed to take uh, in order to make a successful event or whether the, the mandate was going to be run to, to cancel it. But, um, yeah. you know, we got through those two events pretty well, unscathed. There was a lot of, um, a lot of hand sanitizer and gloves and stuff in use over that weekend. But, uh, you know, to our credit to our ops team who did a, an amazing job in a couple of days to, to turn that around and, and make it a successful event. And then obviously the world sort of turned upside down with um you know from the from the grand prix and you know having worked at the grand prix for six you know six years i know what goes into running an event of that scale over a 12 month period to sort of uh, have it fall over i know i wish I had it and i didn't even work there so you know i um i did send a note to the ceo at the time and passed on my uh, uh i suppose condolences at the time but uh that would have been a tough uh, a tough time but um as you said it sort of led the way of of what was to happen from then on in and we looked at uh, the fortunate part of where we were at. We had those two events, as I said, Little Bar and Mototapu, and then we were having about a six-week window before our next event, um, which gave us that breathing space. You know, if we had another event the week after, it would have been pretty tough to work out what we were going to do. But the good thing from where we were situated, by luck, certainly not planning, there was about a six-week window before our next event. So, um, you know, our MD got, it, got the, the team together and then sort of worked through what the scenarios could look like. And we had what we felt was probably eight events that were gonna be impacted from that date through to about uh, July, if you like. So, and some of them, you know, big events, um, Ultra Trail Australia, and um, there was a number of events within that window that we thought we had to move. And it, it was eight yeah. events. So we um, went about having a look and working through what other dates were available. So ops team were talking to stakeholders and councils and governments and working through when we could fit them in. And, and then the marketing team were looking about athlete comms and what we're going to do. Um, and look, the team, team did an awesome job in finding the new date. So we've now managed to uh, move, if you like, find um, dates for uh, seven of the eight events that we were thought were going to be affected. And we've gone out and advised all of our athletes and advised them uh, what the timings would be with that new event and the plan accordingly. And so we've got one more event to go uh, that we're working through with the stakeholders at the moment. But you know, we've, we've effectively moved um, seven of those eight events that were going to be impacted. You know, there is some, still some risk because we don't have a crystal ball. And, you know, I was listening to some, some podcasts about, you know, when something happens, whether it be a hurricane or whatever it is, you know, there is an end game, you clean up, you go again. But uh, there's no end game at this stage with, with COVID-19, which is was problematic. But you know, we're sort of um, taking counsel from governments and advisors and our counterparts in the US to work out what's the best plan. And we think we've got a really good plan in place to to roll out those events. Um, it's certainly going to put a pressure on it for, if it all goes as we suggested, we'll make the, we'll be running 22 events in 18 weeks, which will be a pretty big, uh, pretty big window uh, with a cluttered environment. Cause I think there'll be a lot of events you know, like ours that are looking for those dates and some have been secured and some are still waiting. So mm. it's going to be a, uh, a pretty cluttered um, back end, but you know, we're, we're confident that um, when and if we were given the green light, that we've got the team in place to to really make uh, you know a great fist of those events in the, in the back sort of half quarter of, of this year. Yeah, that's 
I mean, some great points, uh, Jeremy. I think it's, it's interesting, even reflecting back a, a month or six weeks ago, isn't it, that um, how quickly things did change. And, and, and as you said, that um, it was almost, uh, we're almost blindsided in some respects by the whole situation. And, and um, day by day, the, the situation changed. And uh, I guess it revealed how complex some of our events are and, or how many um, moving parts and stakeholders are involved when you have to make decisions like like these um, and, and how quickly you needed to come together to consult the right people and, and make the right calls based on the information you had. Look, absolutely. And, and I've got to say, you know, um, all of our stakeholders from government partners to commercial partners uh, have been sensational through the whole process. You know, um, we're all in it, as you said before, we're all in it together, but um, you know, the, the co collaboration and the the unity, if you like, both within our team internally, but externally, has been sensational. And everyone wants the events to come back. Everyone's trying to look at you know the dates and and try to make a good fist of it. You know, I'm of the view that you know, events are going to be uh, whenever they do come back are going to be a, a really um, strong focus for the broader community. They're getting back out there, and you know, we see people training on wind trainers or going for a run um, in certain areas and. Um, and, and sort of making a fist of their health and well-being, their exercise. So we think that you know if we've got our ducks in a row, that um, events will come back, you know, pretty pretty strong. And um, uh, depending on borders and all those sort of things, but um, yeah, we're we're pretty excited you know, when it does come back that uh, we've got a plan in place to run some awesome events that uh, will be uh, pretty exciting for a lot of our participants who are eager and and willing and able to get out. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Jeremy. I, I certainly think there'll be, uh, be a, real, a real strong demand in, in various events to, to get back out there and come, come together again and whether it's being active or for whatever, whatever the reason, I think we're going to see a big yeah. bounce back. So it's, it's good to be ready for that, isn't it? Um, yeah. I'm really keen to get your thoughts in terms of um, some of the other opportunities and, and things that might happen. I will come back to you. One thing I did want to ask you, though, in terms of um, advice to people making decisions around postponing or, or cancelling events and, and I suppose just what you talked about, um, I guess there's a different answer probably for different events and different scenarios, but some of the principles you sort of went through in terms of deciding whether to cancel or postpone and, and when to postpone until. Well, look, you know, we didn't want to use the C word of cancel. We wanted to yep. be really optimistic and, and look at uh, postponing dates. And I think the difficulty to you at the moment is that it's very hard to get all the information and all the facts. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, there's opinions and, um, and then, then there's experts and, uh, it, but it's really hard to garner all of the information. You know, you've got federal government information, you've got state government information, all differing in some areas. But what we, in looking at where we're at and you look at some timelines from, you know, what happened in China and, and certain things of when those things were opened up, we wanted to try and push it out as far as we could to give us the best opportunity to run it from both a you know, marketing standpoint and also athlete comms and things like that. So you know, we, we try to push them out as far as we possibly could to give us the best run at it. Um, and, and that's all you can really do. Um, you know, we're dealing with our, as I said, you know, our government partners have been significant throughout this whole process and, and, and understanding, you know, what their objectives are and what their information is. But a lot of the time, they don't necessarily know either as well because they don't know end game. Um, but you'd like to think that if, you know, if, you know, in both Australia and New Zealand, we're pretty fortunate that I think that uh, collectively we're doing a great job in containing it. And, um, you know, if we can keep going down this path and, you know, if we can sort of look at a, a May, June, that we're, we're sort of opening up certain areas of those restrictions that we should be in good shape for the back end of the year. But, you know, th there is an element of unknown, mate, but it's just a matter of us making the best decisions on all the information we got just deal in the facts. Um, there's opinions yeah. and stuff like that, which are great, but just try to deal in the facts, do the best thing we can to uh, to get them out. And, you know, our athlete services guys have been fantastic and they've been under the pump, but, um, you know, just communicating as much as we can, you know, messaging to our customers, both on social media and direct has been important to just keep them up to speed. And they've all been sympathetic, but I'll tell you what, they're passionate and eager and wanting to get back out there. So, um, yeah, we're hopeful that we can we can run them we're all in that back sort of half quarter, and you know, time will tell, mate. But fingers crossed. Yeah, that's great. I th and I think there's a couple of really good, good points in that, Jeremy. I think you're making the decisions on what we do know that we, we know there's some known unknowns, as we like to call it. There's some unknown unknowns, and <laughs> it's a, you know, I think um, that that's all you can do, isn't it? Get the best information you can, and make evidence-based decisions, I guess, is, is critical. And, but also, as you said, keep, keep talking to people, um, 
whether that's stakeholders or your your audience to, to make sure they know sort of what you're up to and why you're making these decisions yeah yeah um yeah. And I, th I think um the good it's nice nice to hear from you lucinda in terms of um your role uh, at, at new south wales government in terms of what that involves and i know you're in a sort of position to be um connecting with a number of different event um, organizers and, and being sort of a, a central hub of information if you like so can you tell us a bit about your role and, and what you've seen over the last um the last month or so yeah sure thanks andrew um as you said in your introduction um i work for the office of sport in state government in new south wales and the office of sport charter is to get more people participating in sport and active recreation across the board so the unit that i work in is the major sports events unit and that was set up in about 2017. And it was set up um, originally to try and leverage government's investment in the major events that were coming to the state to benefit the sports sector and, and the communities in which it goes, those events go to. So that was, that was what we were set up um, originally to do. And we worked with what really wide variety of events across that, that period. And then about um, two years ago, we announced um, a strategy in New South Wales to attract 10 World Cups to New South Wales in 10 years. And mm. so now we've got a pipeline of events um, across, um, across the next decade. And we work really closely with the national sporting organisations for those targeted events to build the bids, to bring the events in to New South Wales. And we work across government to get all of the information required for those events. Mm. And that's in the, that's in the pre event we don't know if we won at that point in time and then when we do win the events um, we work really closely with the national sporting organizations to set up the governance structures for the local organizing committees to make sure that they're going to be within a framework that not only is going to deliver a really great event for new south wales but also that they're going to work really well in with the, the structures that are already within government and then we work with them at the planning phase to make sure that all the services that are required, you know, transport and policing and security and health and um, we work across borders. So we work with the feds to ensure that visas and um, some of the other really intricate matters of bringing large groups of people in if they're carrying guns or bringing horses, <laughs> all of those things at the, fe at the federal all, level. All those things, yeah. <laughs> And then um, one of the key things that we really have tried to do right from the outset is to build a legacy program for each of the events. And we deliver those legacy programs in the pre-event phase. So in the two years leading up to the event, to, to do two things effectively is to maximise what the sport will get out of delivering the event, but also um, to build buzz, like to build some, some anticipation that the event's coming to a particular community or coming to the state to encourage people to get on board with the events and um, to really make the most of it. Mm. So, so that's what I do. Yeah, and that's it. And I think I'm um, really interested in terms of what you're sort of seeing and hearing um, in terms of how event organisers are approaching the current situation and um, both short, medium and long term and, and um, also keen on that sort of that hearing a bit more about that long-term vision, is that still the vision and, and you know, I guess uh, that things haven't come to a halt and that we're going to keep keep working on what the future looks like? Yeah, and from, from where I sit, you know, it, it's easy to look forward because, you know, we've got events planned for 2021, 2022, 2023, we've got bids in for 2027. So there is a really strong pipeline of events um, coming forward. For those events that are, you know, have, have major events coming in the next 12 months, those organisations are doing a lot of scenario planning about mm. what the world might look like at the time that their event comes through. So, you know, they're, they're considering all options and um, it's, it's, more, it's, it's less like a decision tree and more like a question tree at the moment because <laughs> there's a lot of questions mm. about what the world might look like. Yeah. Um, and not so many answers. You know, will the borders be open? Will the state borders be open? What does the International Federation, where, where are their sticking points? What, what would be allowed, what wouldn't be allowed for their, you know, they, these are their flagship events that we're talking about in our pipeline. And they really need to consider what's acceptable for their flagship events. You know, if, if stadiums are open or not open, or if everyone has to sit in every second seat for social distancing, 
um, mm. they're considering all of all of the possible scenarios and and you know as Jeremy said nobody really can look into their crystal ball and say in three months time or mm. which restrictions will be will be over is it a bit of a case of, of having to wait um, or is it a matter of working through those questions in that decision tree or the question tree and 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 just working through and, and getting the best information and advice that people can at this point in time? Is, is there a matter of, of a bit, little bit of patience needed, unfortunately? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think part of, part of the puzzle is knowing where, who's making the decisions at what level. So, you know, whether it's the International Federation who's making a decision on a particular matter and whether it's the federal government, because everybody has different different remits within the whole structure. So the state government has a different remit to the federal government and the International Federation as the event owner um, has, you know, has an end say as to go, no go, but, you yeah. know, they need to have all of these pieces of information from different parts of the structure within the organisation. Mm. So it really is um, quite challenging. Yeah. Do, do you feel that, um, I think we all, we all certainly know that, events take a lot of um, moving parts, things to come together to, to fall into place for an event to happen. Um, in terms of as we come out of this this lockdown, um, do you feel that, that that'll happen quite slowly or do you think um, people and organisations might might sort of jump into the into the fray, if you like, and try and help facilitate things a bit quicker than what they might be previously? Yeah, um, that's really hard to answer. Mm -hmm. Like, if you'd asked me that question a week ago, I would have given you a different answer to the one that I'd give yep. you today. So, yep. and, and if you asked me again tomorrow, I'd probably give you a different answer then. Yep. So, you know, I, I think the messaging in the last, probably in the last three or four days coming out of government has been really positive. You know, the, the numbers are down. Um, they're talking about reopening schools. And it, it feels a little bit like, you know, schools open and then what next and then what next. Um, yeah. You know, is it community sport or, you know, events of 500 people back up and running? But it will definitely be, in my view, staged progression yeah. on the way out. And there will be a sort of be a pause at every level to see mm -hmm. the, the repercussions of what happened when we when we made this one change, this little tweak here, what, what, the, what the result of that was. And there needs to be a bit of a, a lag time in that. Yeah. So that's the best answer I can give you on that one, Andrew. <laughs> And look, no, I think that's very fair. And it's interesting talking to a number of people this week. It, I think um, there's a few steps forward, a few steps sideways, a couple of backwards in terms of um, the, the multiple multiple scenario planning that people are doing. And there's some information which comes about and then um, you know, the goalposts keep shifting. And, and I think what we do know is that the, that the bump back in of the industry, if you like, is going to be slower than the, than the bump out and the, the shutdown, I think, and it's going to take a, a staged approach, as you say. So it's um, just in what sequence and how long each of those phases takes, I suppose, is the, is the question. Yeah. Um, to, Tom, I might come, come back to you now. Just um, in terms of what I think a lot of our uh, audience are interested in from their perspective, when they might be getting back to work, when the industry might be sort of um, kicking in. And again, these are, these are unknown um, questions as, as you've also talked to, but um, to give a bit of an insight in terms of what you're working on, your team is uh, sort of focusing on over the coming um, weeks and months, I'd be interested just in terms of how you're approaching it all. I think that it's a, a good insight for people to understand what, what's, how some organisations are approaching it at the moment. Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned from the top, we're all, we're all working from home and, and like everyone else going through that, that isolation period, I've, I've clearly got my, my isolation beard um, happening at the moment. Yeah. So um, nicely done. Um, but uh, not looking as clean as you. But um, look, we are certainly um, working through a number of scenarios as, as Jeremy and Lucinda have already touched on. Um, I guess we're both fortunate and unfortunate in a way that um, unlike Jeremy and his team, we've, We've only got two events a year, two major events, but only two. So we we don't have the I guess complexities of you know logistics of trying to rearrange as, as Jeremy said, eighteen events in twenty two weeks clearly doesn't like sleep or anything, and uh, will be a big back end of the year for for Jeremy's team, but also the industry. Um, 
I think where we're just to clarify, Tom, that that's twenty two events in eighteen weeks. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, I'm not, <laughs> not sure how that works then. But um, yeah, yeah, clearly. Um, but um, look, and and I guess where it's a bit difficult for us um, on the international front is that both our events, both the Formula One and the and the MotoGP that we hold down at Phillip Island in in October each year, is that um, the international events, the the competitors all come from all across the world so it might be all well and good that um here in australia we're, we're kind of at the tail end of it all but um for example um donna who are the officiating body of, of the MotoGP gp calendar all predominantly based out of, of spain and italy and we know what's what's happening there so for us it's a it's a it's a interesting time um as we've touched on and, and delicate so we've got to kind of um as lucinda mentioned um a lot of scenario planning going on um for both that event in october which feels like a while away now but um is also very very much on the doorstep and as we all know in, in the major events um world that 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 planning happens months and months and months in advance so it's not like we can um sit and twiddle our thumbs until we we hear something we need to be um going through all those scenario planning um, bits and pieces now. And, and of course, all the, the stakeholders and partners that are involved with these events as well, they need to know what's going on, what their capacity is, what their year looks like. And, um, and then I think the most interesting point, as Jeremy touched on, was it, it sounds like there will be a big cluster of events all at the end of the year and early next year, which will kind of really um, make it interesting to, um, I think it would be, great in, in, in one way because um, as you can probably see everyone's chomping at the bit to kind of get back out there um, look at these events watch these events and um, you know you, you you see the what you know AFL and, and every everyone are doing now where they're kind of um, looking at every scenario under the suns to these hubs and everything which is just crazy to think that that's the world that we're working out of now mm. um, you know I would be Normally, I think you know I'm a I'm a big Essendon fan, and I'll be at um, Anzac Day uh, uh, tomorrow. And it's just crazy to think that you know that now we're in a, in a phase where they're looking at you know uh, quarantine hubs and and playing um, you know strange rounds. So, um, and for us, there's two parts to our events. There's the the, there's the contractual commitment and and what we why we this is putting on the actual events itself, um, which is one part. But then there's the the enjoyment crowd factor as well so whether it's an event with with minimal or no crowds or restrictions in place these are all the scenarios we need to to work through for um for both our events so mm -hmm. um certainly a tricky time but as i said interesting learning experience for us as well yeah absolutely a lot of a lot of scenario planning which event people are good at so hopefully we can apply those uh, those skills to good effect in this in this phase um mostly uh Let's go back to you, Jeremy. I'm interested in um, what the Ironman have done in terms of uh, offering uh, the, the, the virtual um, experience. Uh, I guess that's been a, a, a common theme amongst the conversations in our industry of, of obviously, obviously a, a need immediately to shift to virtual and online experiences and, and um, communication. Um, and, and Ironman was probably one of the the leaders in terms of switching to that so quickly um, and using that as a, a means to, to offer experiences, I suppose. Um, in terms of how that's come about, your thoughts in terms of how that's, how that's going. And then of course, sort of the, when we come out of this, do you see the, the shift uh, you said before, I'm sure people want to come back together physically. And that's certainly, I believe it going to be a, still a, a huge, um, pulling power in, in, in terms of events, but um, just in terms of that whole sort of virtual and physical mix, interested in your views and experience with Ironman on that. Sure, well, I think um, the, the virtual uh, racing club that Ironman have just launched, uh, I think there's about four weeks ago, in effect, yep. um, was always something that they had planned to do, but it was yep. just a non-urgent project. One of those projects they'll get to when they need to get to it. You know, when you're mm. running events, things get busy and you know, the equality and control of the event is the most important thing. Um, obviously, when this um, pandemic hit, um, they then thought, well, we better get our act into gear with this virtual racing club and get that happening. And, you know, the guys in our, um, our head office in Tampa, from what I gather, you know, they're working 24-7 to get this product up and running. 
and you know, the end result from from you know virtual racing uh, one was was phenomenal in terms of what they turned around in such a short space of time to get it launched. There was a, a you know a strict deadline that someone set, and uh, bang, they made it happen and they launched. And uh, this is up to there's a uh, another race this weekend um, uh, up to I think this is the fourth week that'll be run, and. You know, I think it's um, exceeded expectations. I think they've got something like 65,000 plus registrations from something like 100 companies that are participating in it. You know, there's a pro race component, but there's a, you know, just a, a general um, either Ironman athlete or even just um, uh, a, a rank and file customer like me that, you know, last weekend was a, I think it was a 5K, uh, no, 1.5K run, uh, a 10K bike and a 5K run sort of thing so it was a you know a, a sprint distance it was it was a reasonably uh easy volume of um of kilometers that that was a, probably open to anyone i think they got somewhere between forty thousand people actually participating in that in that event and um and then they've, you know they've had a, a 70.3 distance and so on but it's been um really really well received uh i think if you i've been a little bit ignorant to to an iron man athlete having come from different areas of, of sport and events but you know, I think you're finding that a lot of um, Ironman and, and triathletes are now training on wind trainers, where they used to be out on roads. You know, so they're they're moving their uh, training re regime into uh, wind trainers for for um for, and and treadmills for running. You know, if the weather's Ooh. no good, whatever, you know, particularly in the winter months, you know, um, training indoors has been a real part of their training mix. So now that there's a little bit of element of competition and racing and a and a virtual club. Um, you know, it'll be, it will be forming part of our Ironman uh, platform ongoing, running in parallel with their real life events. Um, so I think there's, there's nothing like crossing the finish line in real life after the, the hard work and training and, and crossing that finish line, whether you do it in, you know, under four hours or whether you're doing it in, in um, you know, 17 hours, as is often the case when you finish at midnight after starting at 6am or 7am. It's, um, you know, I was in uh, uh, New Zealand for the... Um, Ironman New Zealand event and watching, you know, the last runner come through just on, just before midnight after, you know, starting out at 6am, it was just uh, an amazing sight and experience and, yeah. and, uh, yeah, quite emotional, you know, and um, just watching it happen is, is phenomenal. So you've got the elite of the elite, but you've also got the rank and file that are just doing the, perhaps the one-off challenge to, uh, to do that Ironman event. And um, that's something that's just in my mind mentally. I'm just not sure I'm quite ready to do yet, but uh, maybe at some stage, maybe at some stage. So, yeah, I think the virtual racing um, will definitely be part of our uh, mix moving forward, without doubt. Mm. And, um, you know, I think there's a number of events. You know, look at the Mother's Day Classic going virtual, and uh, I think it'll be part of our part of our mix. And even the um, the Red Bull Wings for Life, Andrew, which you have been a part mm. of, you know, that's been a a virtual race for probably five, six years now. Um, yep. And now they've gone totally virtual this year. So um, it's not new. It's obviously just been tweaked in some regard. And, um, you know, I think it'll be definitely part of um, our way of life uh, moving forward. I think you look at esports, the growth of esports um, has been you know, phenomenal over this last little while as well. And that's, that's an area that has probably not impacted at all. In fact, it's probably spiked in this particular area whilst, um, whilst we're sort of in lockdown, it's, uh, it's a per perfect vehicle in terms of the, the e-sport uh, phenomena. Mm. I, th I think it's a, a great example. Um, I encourage people to, to check out the, the Ironman virtual platform. And, and I think, um, as you say, Jeremy, it's, it's a good example of a, of a catalyst within an organisation to, to shift a lot of the experience to, to virtual. And I think that's um, yeah, it's accelerated a lot of event organisers playing in that space and moving into that space. And um, so I think that that's a good thing and um, no doubt will remain. And it'd be fascinating to see how much of a mix it is and the event experiences in the future. Um, and um, yeah, good to see it's inspired you to do an Ironman. So we'll look forward to seeing that. <laughs> I think, Not um, sure. <laughs> yeah. I think um, Ants put a good question in the, um, in the, in the Q and A box and um, talking about, you know, there's a lot of uh, fear mongers uh, talking about the industry changing forever and, and I guess interested in the views on, on that. Um, so I'd, keen, keen on your views and, and Jeremy, I suppose from your, your position as working in the commercial role, um, generally speaking, as much as you know, it, it, how has the, the commercial world, the brands sort of reacted to the situation? Um, and has there been a, a shift yet in terms of the way they see events and, and their investment in events, or is that a bit of a wait and see approach? 
Um, they're all wanting to insert pandemics into the clauses of contracts, yes, um, yeah. <laughs> which have yeah. probably been excluded. I don't think many people had thought that. No. Uh, look, I think um, generally, I think you look at it at the moment, we've got you know our existing partners who have been very, very supportive and understanding of the, the whole dynamic. Mm. You know, ultimately, they want to get their um, ROI as well. So that, that hasn't changed. Um, so they're still working with us to say, okay, well, what does it mean for me? You know, is there change for me? And, and, and fundamentally, if we get our event calendar as, as we have planned there should be no real major impact i think um when when people say oh it's going to change the landscape forever I, I don't think it'll change it forever i think there'll be definitely some things that we'll do differently with, without question at the back end of this this year for our events and yeah. um and some of them will be efficiencies or savings that you think hey well they're, they're great little things that we we were done because of this particular pandemic that we should carry over into to the future years um, from a commercial space, um, ironically, um, you know, we're sort of, we've got a team that are working on, you know, prospecting and, and chatting to new customers at the moment, which has always been a difficult task. But I tell you, at the moment, um, a lot of people are actually wanting to have a discussion. You know, there, yep. there's some downtime or some flat time. So, um, and, and I'm encouraging them to, to get out and have those discussions, albeit via Zoom or Teams or on the phone. Because when the wheel turns, hopefully we're at the front of the front of the queue in terms of what our offering looks like. So um, they follow it up by saying, "Look, um, we've got no budget. It's on, you know, it's on hold for the next 12 weeks or whatever it is, which which we, is fine, and we and we get it. Um, and and most businesses are in the same boat, trying to you know maintain cash flow. Um, but it, I think what it has done, it's actually opened up the door to have conversations. You know, I think yeah, people great. are. I won't say sitting idle, um, but people are looking for different things to chat about and, you know, they're sitting in their makeshift bedroom or kitchen or lounge room, whatever it is, and, and they want to have different conversations. So from that point of view, it's, you know, I'm taking it as a, as a real positive. Um, mm. And and hopefully we can start to explain our event portfolio and, and work through some of those things. But, um, you know, generally, obviously things have slowed up. How it comes back out um, w when we do get back to the, the new norm will be interesting to see because, you know, budgets will be different, um, you know, businesses will be hurting, you know, we run a, a significant expo across all of our events, you know, and, and that's a, a significant part of our business as well. Um, mm. But a lot of these are smaller medium enterprises who are probably going to find it harder to bounce back or to spend that, you know, that smaller investment. Um, and then on the flip side, there'll be other companies that will be wanting to invest in getting out there and spending their money, you know, um, and I don't want to sort of uh, diss any other event or sport or wherever it is, but some of those sporting clubs um, will need to probably give some level of refunds or rebates back to those particular commercial partners that have been involved with an AFL club or whatever it might be. So there might be some level of cash that those companies need to spend at the end of this year or into next year that um, is a consequence of a disappointing part of another phase of, of a, a sponsorship uh, something like that. So they're all still to be determined. But um, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a as most people will be, I'm a half past full person, and I'm relatively optimistic. Whilst it's going to be tough, but it's no tougher than probably what it is, you know, six months ago. It's you know, commercial partnerships is a very tough sell. You know, yep. across sport and sponsorships, it's it's not easy. You got to work hard. Um, so I see it's not a not a great deal of difference. You just might have to work a little bit harder, a little bit smarter. So. You know, as I said, I'm pretty optimistic, and you know we've we've got a great event portfolio that um, you know we can we can turn from an Ironman event um, to a city to serve event who have got very very different customers, so we can appeal to a broader audience um, than most other event companies. And I'm not I'm not sort of saying that to this anyone else. It's just saying mm. we've got a great portfolio that's that can differentiate from from a customer's point of view, which is good. Yeah, and I appreciate your optimism, JK, and and I think. Um, and look, maybe I'm a bit of an idealist as well, but I do hope that um, that whole case of when you take something away, people realise how valuable it is. And I think, you know, hopefully um, brands uh, are potentially recognising the role events you know, can and do, does play in, in their overall campaigns and the way that the role that can play in, in communicating and interacting with their audiences. And as you said, you know, perhaps an opportunity to start thinking a bit differently um, We've probably struggled to change the conversation over the years and, and give evidence of the value of events. So maybe some of these, um, you know, some of the things that are going on at the moment will, will change that, that thinking and that conversation. Definitely. I think also, you know, if, if budgets are, you know, in terms of corporate 
company's budgets are sort of slashed or, or you know reduced or whatever it is, or they've got to look at a new way, you know. So where they might have been spending on an above the line campaign, radio, TV, wherever it might be, or digital, you know, the experiential element of what we do and getting the product or the experience into the hands of a customer and a, and a major event or an event generally is a very, very easy way to get that product or the the, the message into a consumer's hand via an event. So I think it could be a, a cheaper alternative to a, to an above the line campaign, which might've been a traditional way that they look at it. So that's another area that I think that, um, you know, events could play a significant part, albeit, you know, a small investment from a major above the line campaign, but experiential getting the, the product at the hands of a customer, I think events will definitely play a part, uh, you know, over this next six to 12 months, particularly. Yeah, good call. I'm, I'm sold. You've got me. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, I guess looking at the future, Lucinda, um, you know, your, your sort of views in terms of uh, from your position, you know, how you see it uh, un, um, not unraveling, unfolding, um, developing. Um, and I think also just in terms of, as, as Chad Gay's called out, there's going to be potentially a lot of events occurring um, in a short space of time. It sounds like Iron Man certainly will. Um, in terms of any advice you've got around um, you know, how that how that might play out and be facilitated, as, as much again as we do know at the moment, um, how do you see how do you see that? And what sort of advice would you give to people looking at that? Yeah, look, I I definitely think that there's going to be a, quite a crowded calendar, and I think that will probably flow on certainly on the international level for a longer period than we're anticipating at the moment you know, because the Olympics got moved and, and a whole bunch of other international events have, have all shifted where they are. So the international calendar is still um, very much in flux. I would say that um, that being the case, and I certainly don't mean to be negative, there is going to be some commercial pressures for those events to try and, you know, it's a crowded marketplace and, and everybody wants a little piece of that pie. Um, so the, the event the event owners are really going to need to be quite polished in what they're able to articulate is their offering as opposed to the other events that are available at that time because you know all the all the um, um, noises seem to say that the economy is going to be quite flat for a little while mm. so I think it's a really good opportunity now to you know really really think about what what each event has to offer and what it differentiates it from the other events in the marketplace and be really clear and um, able to articulate who the market is that you can reach at each point in, in, in for your different events. Yep. So I, I think there's some good thinking that can be done now in readiness for, for that crowded marketplace. Mm. And um, I think also there might be quite a shift in how people consume their sport, I think people have become quite used, well, five weeks. It, it, <laughs> there's a lot of change that's happened yeah. in five weeks and people, people like me who would never watch sport on a streaming service now do that. And so I think there's also opportunities for the smaller events who wouldn't normally get broadcast to really jump on board with that because once somebody's tried something once, they're more likely to do it a second time. So there's far more opportunity or it might be a much bigger market in that streaming service or online on, to, to actually get a different audience to what um, people have had previously. I think it's a really interesting call out, Lucinda, and um, you know, it came up in a recent conversation I was having that, that there's going to be opportunities come out of this that um, may not have been around before and whether that's um, broadcasters or, or content providers looking for content and um, not being international content available. And so then potentially some, some of the domestic events um, can, can fulfill that. Um, so, you know, there, in all sorts of different ways, there might be some opportunities that come out and, and that people can take advantage of. And I, and I think um, this time, certainly in the last couple of weeks, we've really had, um, it's really been really obvious to me that people are crying out to watch some sport. I mean, the, the guy who, the 100 year old who did 100 laps of his garden, people were watching that for, for a very long time. Yeah. People are really crying out for a bit of sport. To, um, to get on board with. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm just going to call out, please drop any, any questions you have for our panellists um, as we get towards the end of today's chat. Um, one thing, I'll, I'll come back to you, Tom. Um, 
one thing I think a lot of our uh, audience have been asking naturally enough is in terms of from their perspective, um, what it is they, they can and should be doing right now um, to, I suppose, um, make the most or, or of this um, phase. And in terms of as employers, what, um, you know, what advice can you give to individuals in terms of the types of things and the, the, the skills that they should be developing during this period? Um, you know, from your point of view, you, you obviously have a large team, but also um, you know, work with a, a huge range of different suppliers and, and stakeholders. Um, what would be your, your sort of take in terms of what, what is that people should be, how they should be investing their time and, um, over the coming weeks and months? Yeah, it's, a, it's a, a question that we're all asking ourselves, I think, Andrew. And um, I think, you know, all of us being involved in the events industry, events are about being dynamic. And, you know, whether that's from a um, company needing to relook at the way in which, you know, as we've discussed, these new norms are, and, and as I'm sure we, we will all, whatever they are, that, you know, we're all in this dynamic situation and um, I think we're the best place industry to be dynamic to be able to change and adapt to that. So um, mm. I don't think it's, um, you know, uh, dire stations yet where people should be um, worrying. I certainly think, although the events industry at the moment probably been hit hard, I think it will come back stronger than ever. So for those people that are probably, you know, maybe... Um, out of work at the moment or, or wondering um, where it's going to end up. I think, as, as I said, it's probably at the moment um, being a little bit patient, but um, using this time to, to reach out to, to, to industry professionals and perfect example is, you know, tuning into today's thing and, and, and learning um, what, what's going on. Um, and I think um, as, as we've all seen that the industry has been kind of, um, severely hit from a from a resourcing point of view and staff cuts that but that only means that once we do get a bit of normality back that there'll be that many um positions and um different ways in which people are working now available that um you know you want to be you know front of the line there with your hand up and, and you need to already reach it out so certainly um doesn't stop networking doesn't stop um you know chatting with people i've had that many virtual coffees um with people that um, my wife wonders what I actually do all day. So <laughs> I say I've got another meeting. It's just she hears me banging on having a, a virtual coffee. So um, it's, um, yeah, it's certainly an interesting time, but um, it's sticking fat. And um, as I said, I, I think we'll be stronger than ever. So um, an exciting time, really. If you can, same as Jeremy, I think I'm a bit of a half class full type of guy as well. And um, fortunate enough to still, you know, have a job and, and be in the industry and, and doing what I love, but um, certainly um, we're, we're looking forward. We're not looking backwards. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, good, good, good advice. I think um, there's a couple of questions just just popped up. Um, we might try and get to before ten. But Holly, um, maybe one for you, Lucinda. Holly was just asking, I suppose, with the the only um, known being the unknown. Um, sort of thoughts around being able to create more stability for event organizations or I suppose um, support for the industry and um, preparing for what might be some challenging times ahead. Um, any thoughts in terms of what can be done as an industry or for the industry? Um, probably a big question, but uh, thoughts around that, Lucinda? Look, I think the industry is doing a remarkable job in supporting one another through this, I, I really, I mean, I applaud you, Andrew, for putting these on each week and giving a chance for everyone to connect and remain connected. I mean, that the industry itself actually needs to work together. We're talking about the crowded marketplace. Everybody needs to understand that that's, that's the situation right now. And I think they do. And there needs to be a lot of cooperation. And it goes so far as, you know, the resourcing of those events. There's only so many crowd barriers that, any city has or can get access to for a period of time. So there really does need to be good communication across the industry and cooperation um, from each of the, the different event owners. At, 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 when we start to come out of this, that's gonna be really important that um, we continue the collaborative efforts that, that the industry is showing at this time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I think that's right. And. Um, 
I think we've all recognised we're somewhat um, fragmented as, a, as an industry in many respects, probably structurally, if, if you like, but then there's a, there's a huge amount of collaboration and togetherness, if you like, um, as an industry. Um, you know, we, as, as event professionals, certainly are more than comfortable sharing ideas and challenges and opportunities. I think we're, we're certainly a very collaborative group of people, but, um, you know, structurally, that's probably not there so much in terms of how the events industries put together so I think it's a good call out to be sort of talking and working together as much as we can. Um, I, there's a question there from Steve Goss, so I might go to you for this one Jeremy. Um, he asks, Goss he tends to ask the difficult questions of you I'm sure many times. But, Gossie, um, look out! Yeah, if you've uh, read the question but um, talking about how there are it, obviously a lot of people um, that have been made redundant in those sort of mid-management levels if you like um, and asking whether We'll, we'll have a, a bit of a skills gap when things start to re-emerge and I guess organisations rebuild, re-employ, um, which could happen quite quickly. Um, I, I guess, you know, Gossie's asking, um, you know, is, is there going to be an issue around that sort of uh, natural immediate need to make those current decisions in terms of um, when businesses resume and, and get up to, to full, full, full gas again? Yeah, look, I think it, it depends on the business. You know, mm. like some businesses just have to make the call because they just don't have the cash flow to continue a, a staff. That's just a statement of fact. And hopefully a number of the, these event companies are jumping on the JobKeeper and getting, you know, at least that to try and keep the staff in place, um, which I know some having had some discussions with some event companies, you're def definitely doing that. Um, and we're fortunate at the moment. We've not stood down any staff and hopefully we can get through this without having to do so. But the realisation is that some companies just have to, they just have to do it to maintain the business into the future. And whilst I think we'd be very naive to think that we're just going to come back and we're going to have a hundred percent complement of the staff, we are going to lose some people out of the industry, no question, you know, but I often use that, you know, good things happen to good people. So good people, good staff will be re-engaged and re-employed, whether it be within um, Ironman or, or, or Grand Prix or anywhere else, you know, whether it be in, in government sport, good people will get, picked up somewhere I, I'm very confident that there'll be no skills gap yes we'll lose good people um, no question because people have got to survive and they've got to you know pay school fees and and feed the kids and all that sort of stuff so yeah. we're going to lose people to to other industries or whatever it might be but I, I'm confident that you know the event the event caper breeds really really good quality people you know and think you're in it and most of the people you know whether you've worked at an AFL club or you've worked at the Grand Prix or work at Ironman you know there's, there's a lot of people that we all know and we stay connected because we love what we do. Um, and I think if you're passionate about it and you're good at what you do, you'll find your place. Um, so I'm very confident there'll be no skills gap because I think also event people um, love what they do and people will also want to get into the industry. So there's probably people that are highly skilled that are not in the event space at the moment that would love to get into the event space that could fill a gap really, really well. So mm. um very good question, Gossie, but um, now I'm, I'm, again, pretty optimistic about uh, what might happen for the future. Brilliant, brilliant. I think it's a, a great note to, to finish on today. So, um, look, uh, conscious we're coming up to 10 o'clock and um, people will be off to their next virtual coffees, perhaps, or next, next meetings. Um, so I, I do want to say thanks to our panellists, to, to Tom, Jeremy, Lucinda, for giving up their time today. I really do appreciate that. Um, and to you all for joining us, really do uh, appreciate you, you tuning in um, and we'll keep these sessions going for the coming weeks and um, as long as I suppose people are, are finding them valuable. Um, we've got a great group of um, female leaders in our industry next week um, who I think between them have worked on probably most of the major events around the world in the last 10, 15 years. Um, and also want to start to, to look at some of the big issues that are facing us in, as an industry, um, regardless of the current situation. And there's, I know there's a lot of interest in terms of uh, sustainability in our industry. So um, we're going to, to tap into some of those, those big issues um, and look ahead um, a little bit over the coming weeks as well. So um, thanks again for everyone for joining us. Thanks, um, Tom, Jeremy, Lucinda. Um, Again, if I can help anyone, please jump on the website. All the previous event shows are out there um, uh, so that you can tune into. There's a bunch of stuff on my website. Um, also going to run some sessions in the coming weeks, which are more focused on turning the spotlight back on, back on you, back on the, um, the individuals in our industry and seeing um, how we can set up our next steps to um, 
to, to re-emerge from the situation in, in, a, in a good, positive way. So um, plenty of stuff there to, to tune into. But um, thank you all again, and um, hope we all can see you again in the coming weeks. Thanks very much. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Tom, Lucinda. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.